Citizenship is a community act. Democracy gets its power from the people. The shrinking of people participating in that process over time has landed us in a more polarized space. This is How to Be a Citizen from Pantsu Politics. Over four episodes, we talk about how to vote, how to debate, how to think about our relationship to our government and our communities. Join us as we think about what America in 2020 should be and what we should be to America. Hi, everyone. This is Elise, Managing Director of Pantsuit Politics. Before we jump into our How to Be a Citizen series, I wanted to let you know about some of the exciting bonus content we have over on our Patreon page to accompany this series. For as little as a dollar a month, you can join our Patreon community and get access to a huge library of bonus content, including content specific to this How to Be a Citizen series. So patrons of all levels will get access to deep dives on the Federalist Papers, you'll get to hear conversations Beth is having with her young daughters about what citizenship means, and we have a series of amazing coloring pages we commissioned to go along with this series. A special thank you to Carolyn Schwartz, aka Soul Mama, for her creativity and beautiful Beautiful work on those pages. She took our very abstract ideas and made them come to life. You can find more of her work, including her latest and 13th coloring book, Wash Your Damn Hands and Other Useful Advice for Surviving Crazy Times, a quarantine coloring book, on her website, her Etsy page, and social media pages, all of which we've linked in the show notes. So to get access to all of that exciting bonus content to go along with this series, make sure you join our amazing community of listeners supporting the show at patreon.com slash pantsuitpolitics. We couldn't do what we do without your generous support. This is Sarah and Beth. You're listening to Pantsuit Politics, the home of grace filled political conversations. Hello, everyone. We're so excited that you're joining us for our summer series. If you remember last summer, we worked on the Bill of Rights. This summer, we're going to go back even farther and start to think about the creation of our Constitution and rolling forward through the Federalist Papers into how we vote today. So our goal is for all of us to come together and think about what it means to be a citizen, and the questions that we constantly ask on our own and in community around citizenship. Because citizenship is really just an exchange of responsibilities. It's between individuals and communities and their government. And we want to think about that exchange. What do we owe our government and each other? Consistent consideration of what we want the government to be, for sure, what we want it to do, how we want it to operate. How do we do that? How do we do that beyond the sort of generic responsibilities of citizenship we all take for granted? Paying taxes, voting, obeying the laws. What responsibilities are involved in getting the government to do what we want beyond those basic essential things? So we're going to take this week and next and try to bring some grace and nuance and depth to the role we share as citizens. During this particular moment in history, many of us are thinking about citizenship for the first time. We hear from so many of you that you have always voted, almost just out of habit, but that you really want to tackle every act as a citizen, especially voting, with greater intention. And we think that's exactly what the nation needs right now. Okay, so let's talk about citizenship generally. It started with the ancient Greeks because you were an inhabitant of a city. And now it's really expanded in the definition. You're a member of a state, either through birth or the naturalization process. And so you either owe an allegiance to the government and in return, you are entitled to its protection. And I've been really thinking about citizenship as an active process as opposed to just membership, just membership in a club, which I think for better or for worse is what it's become to many of us in the United States. It's a membership we don't spend a lot of time thinking about. It's just something we belong to, and we take what we need, and that's the end of our contemplation of that identity in our lives, the identity of citizen of the United States. I think we don't spend a whole lot of time even thinking about what the United States is. 
there's so much more complexity than thinking of the United States as a landmass. And even when you think mm-hmm. of it as a landmass, there's complexity around that, around who lived here before America as we know it today was founded? How were indigenous people on this landmass treated when America as we know it today was being founded? And also the fact that even if we think about it in that more contemporary sense that led to the USA, that we had states before we had a constitution, that we had a Congress before we had a constitution. It's really interesting to just consider that loose association of states before we got to a stronger federal government. Well, and look, I mean, you've been doing all these Supreme Court cases, right, on the nightly nuance. We just had with the Supreme Court case, McGirt versus Oklahoma, where we're even reexamining the landmass part of that definition, where we're saying a huge portion of Oklahoma is actually an Indian reservation. So I think this is the perfect time to start thinking about and rethinking and reimagining what does it mean when we say the United States of America? Because I think for better, for worse, and as a Democrat, and, you know, we always say on this podcast that if we're in the car, I'm the gas when it comes to the federal government. And I, for many years, looked at citizenship and thought about the role of government solely through the prism of our national government. And I think the first and most important thing to think about when we start to examine citizenship in the United States of America is a structure that is both state, local, and federal. And that we're not picking a team. We don't have to pick a team. (laughs) That The way that our government was founded and the way it runs right now is a balancing act, not just between the three branches at the national level, but between the federal government and the state governments and the local governments. And that balance and that the energy that exists between those pieces of what composes the United States of America is really, really essential to how we exist as citizens within it. And with everything that we talk about throughout this series, there are going to be considerations behind how we got here that are innovative and noble and enduring. And there are going to be considerations that are racist and classist and xenophobic There are going to be things worth preserving and things worth leaving behind Mm -hmm. and a whole lot of in between. And we want to be willing to sit with all of that together. And one of the guides that we are going to use in this journey is the Federalist Papers. Sarah said, let's talk for a second about what the Federalist Papers are are, um, because I think it's so fascinating to consider that you had this group of thinkers coming together uh, to figure out what the Constitution should look like. And then they understood that they had to sell that concept. And the best way to sell that concept was through media. And so, OK, well, we're, we're living in Hamilton's America. So let's just let's just go ahead and start with the lyrics from nonstop. Alexander joins forces with James Madison and John Jay to write a series of essays defending the new United States Constitution entitled The Federalist Papers. The plan was to write a total of 25 essays. The work divided evenly among the three men. In the end, they wrote 85 essays in the span of six months. John Jay got sick after writing five. James Madison wrote 29. Hamilton wrote the other 51. So... (laughs) Beyond, uh, I promise that we used text beyond Hamilton the Musical in our examination of the Federalist Papers, including, you know, the actual Federalist Papers, and also spending time with Michael Berkman and Chris Beam, political scientist professors and host of Democracy Works, and talking with them about the Federalist Papers and how they were using media because they needed to convince New York that the Constitution was a good idea because it's sort of like now, if you don't have California in your vote, 
what are you doing? They had to have New York for ratification. And so these essays and using the media and using debate and using these conversations about citizenship and government was essential to the founding fathers. They had to do this. They had to convince people to come to their side, to see things the way they saw them. And I think what was so interesting for me in our conversation with Michael and Chris is talking about how even though they were debating the role of the national government or they were debating the Constitution defining how the national government would work, it was all through the filter of states. They had to get the states on board. They had to convince the states. They had to assure the states that their rights would be protected. And so that's really where their focus lied. The Federalist Papers were written by Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, uh, although mostly by Hamilton and Madison. And they were written for the very explicit purpose of trying to persuade the people of New York to ratify the Constitution. So they were written as a form of political persuasion, yet they stand the test of time as a theoretical statement, maybe, of what the Constitution was intended to do and uh, some of the political philosophy behind the Federalist Papers. I think it is important to keep in mind, I mean, not just that it was a, you know, directly political document, but that it was, I mean, (laughs) the whole thing was written in six months. It's just uncanny. I mean, it's literally like two a week that, that Hamilton was putting out. And that was just necessary in order to get New York on board. You know, they, they needed nine states. I think by the time the Federalists were written, they had nine states. And so the new constitution was going to go into effect, but without New York, uh, you know, it didn't matter, right? I mean, you couldn't not have New York. And New York was full of anti-federalists who just were nervous about various dimensions of this new constitution. And so their job, and and really the only job of the Federalist Papers was to convince these people that the constitution was the best document for the new nation. One of the themes running through the Federalist Papers that has caused so much contemplation for me as we've been reading them is a theme of factions. Mm. There is a recognition well articulated by James Madison that people have interests and they always will and they should and that's fine. But people's interests often cause them to act in ways that oppress others. And it's, I think, really poignant in this time when we constantly lament our partisanship, to understand that the Federalist Papers viewed factions as an unavoidable aspect of the human condition. And so we have to guard against them by having more of them, by having so many divergent interests spread out in tension with one another that You can't have coalescence around a dominant interest that oppresses other people. Sometimes I imagine the founders thinking about the pluralism of the United States and being shocked and just thinking like, wow, that that needs a whole new set of rules. And other times I think this is almost exactly what they intended because so much of their writing is about how a republic with all of these competing interests scales up well. If you want to protect against oppression, what you need are more and more and more people thinking differently from one another. All the framers are scared of democracy. Madison is is really articulate about this, but Hamilton was probably worse, right? But Madison said, you know, uh, if every Athenian was Socrates, it would still be a mob. And that's really, really a damning statement, right? If you leave people with direct democracy, their passion is going to overwhelm reason and it's going to end up as a mob. And so the only way to counteract that reality is to separate 
people from the direct expression of their will to to put in breaks. And so that's what the that's what the Constitution is designed to do. Yes, to uh, constrain majority tyranny was a term that Madison used, that uh, majority could be tyrannical and that you needed to impose all kinds of mechanisms to control that. And I, I think that's really, that's why Federalist Number 10 has become such an important paper over time, because that really lays out the basic argument that they want to make, that from given an understanding of human nature and who people are, that you need to understand that they're going to form into factions, that some of these factions will be majority based, that they may not have, that there's no reason they should have the larger interests of the community involved and that you needed to design mechanisms to control majorities. I like to come back to this frequently actually in contemporary politics whenever people are upset about the fact that, you know, it seems like the majority wants something but they're not getting it. And that's true because the system was designed to prevent exactly that. I love that. So here is a quote from Federalist number 10. Either the existence of the same passion or interest in a majority at the same time must be prevented or the majority having such coexistent passion or interest must be rendered by their number and local situation unable to concert and carry into the effect schemes of oppression. It's almost like democracy is based on the consent of the governed. The people are the power. And we are going to build in checks and balances within the government itself. But it's almost like he envisioned at the most basic level, the people are a check. The democracy gets its power from the people and democracy also gets the check it needs, the balance it needs by those same people. You know, it was supposed to be difficult, right? That balance of having this power rise up from the bottom and also the difficulty of organizing all of the people at the same time. Like that was the first check before we get to the Senate and terms and way we elect people. That was the first check they envisioned is that we would check each other because if we're consenting then there has to be a certain amount of basic agreement. And if we can't get to basic agreement, then there's no power from the governed to move forward on that issue. It was like that first, it was like the first check. So there is also a theme running through the Federalist Papers uh, that democracy works really well on a small scale. And on a larger scale, you need that republic to come in and ensure that all those competing places, people, interests meet through representatives who are called to think about the whole. Because you can't trust those small segments of the population to think about the whole, and that's fine. But we must elect folks who are connected to the small interests and also connected to the big picture. And that's a really nice framework for thinking about who we vote for, and how we vote. So we started at those levels of government, particularly state and federal, because you see the same organization at both the state and federal level, which is brilliant and also confusing (laughs) in certain ways, because you have the three branches of government that we all know about, our little schoolhouse rocks, education. You have executive, legislative, and judicial at the national level. You have the president, you have the United States House of Representatives, the United States Senate, and the Supreme Court. And then you also have similar structures at the state levels. You have governors, you have state representatives, state senators, and state judicial branches. Of course, it gets confusing because the Supreme Court is appointed The judicial branches in many state governments are elected. You have different term breakdowns, different sizes among the state representatives and the state senates. But if you can keep that general structure in mind, you're going to see how and where and who we're voting for at both the state and national level. 
Another thing that the Federalist Papers has really clarified for me, and I knew this, and it's formed a huge part of my political philosophy for a long time, but I never got it in this way, is that that legislative branch is the driver. The the vision is that mm-hmm. the legislative branch should be the center. We talk so much about co-equal branches, but it's described in Article 1 for a reason. We lead mm-hmm. with those direct representatives of the people. And because that branch is so powerful, it has to check itself. And that's why we have two chambers. Yep. We have the House and the Senate to provide checks on each other within this branch that we see as so powerful. And then there is an interplay between how the House has the power of impeachment over the president, but the Senate decides how to try the president after that impeachment takes place. The The idea that the, the Congress is driving the car of our government, as I would explain it to my kids, really came through for me reading the Federalist Papers. And I think when we vote, it's a good idea to kind of have this metaphor of a car going that the legislature should be driving and there are a lot of things going on when you drive. And the executive branch, who we choose as the president, who we choose to be the governor of our state or the mayor of our town, that's the engine because that's how that vision gets executed every day. And sometimes that engine can just cut the power through a veto because there is that tension between the driver and the engine. And then the judicial branch, if you're voting for judges in your state, a good framework for that is to think of them as road signs. Sometimes they have to put in a hard stop. Most of the time, it's going to be green lights for what the government is doing. But they're the people who are really providing an assurance that the car is going in a direction consistent with the basic principles of driving. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I, but I think the reason it's hard to imagine it that way is because in our current cultural imagination, the president is driving the car and the Congress throws on the brakes every once in a while or the Supreme mm-hmm. Court throws on the brakes every once in a while. And that's it. The president is driving the car. That's how everybody thinks about the role of government. That's why I think that election takes such predominance in our national conversations, because, you know, just to take this metaphor as far as we possibly can go, as the pace of change sped up, we wanted the car to go faster. And there are some times where we do need the car to go fast. For example, in the middle of a global pandemic. And I think that's what's difficult is how do we do that and protect the system? How do we sometimes say in this situation, the president needs to be in the driver's seat? We don't have a good answer to that because the second he's in the driver's seat or she's in the driver's seat, it's real hard to get him out. You know, as we're talking about these conversations about what do we want our government to do, if the government and the system under these founding documents was supposed to be messy and complicated and slow great, what does it mean when we need it to speed up? How do we do that and protect the system? I don't think we found a good answer to that yet. Well, this calls to mind another aspect of this metaphor for me, which is that a car is not the only place to get from point A to point B. And Mm. as we think of ourselves as citizens... It definitely wasn't in 1776. (laughs) Well, that's right. And we can't focus all of our obligations to one another on our government, right? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you need a car, sometimes you need a jet. And what you see in the United States today, I think, is that culture is the jet. And sometimes you need to walk somewhere, you know, and and that can be a faster way to meet the need. That could look like a localized nonprofit. You know, there are lots of ways that we accomplish things in our country, and there are lots of manifestations of that sense of responsibility to the people around you and the place where you are that happen around the car. And of course, it all affects everything else. But I've been I've been thinking a lot about that, too, as it relates to COVID-19, 
Because you can see where, in some instances, the car is pretty stalled out, but there are tons of bikes and planes and buses kind of working Mm -hmm. around it to figure this out. Let's talk about another very important aspect of our ballots and voting and our roles of citizenship and an important consideration in those founding documents, which is political parties. We had a really interesting conversation with Michael and Chris about whether or not Madison and Hamilton considered factions as parties and what were the roles of if we're trying to walk that line, if we're trying to to push the pace of change faster, if we're trying to make adjustments to protect the process, I do think there's a really important role for parties. And they are, I think, in theory, supposed to be that in between the the people and the consent of the governed and the people filling those important jobs in the Republican form of government we currently have. And so I, I want to share a little bit of, of that sort of debate we had about parties and how they saw the role of parties. I mean, that is a, a complicated question. But I do think that, you it's know, good question, the, yeah, the, but the, the issue for Madison especially is not democracy per se. It is faction. It is the, mm-hmm. the fact that people are going to naturally divide and, conf- and, and be in conflict with each other. And if you don't find ways of managing that conflict, you're going to end up destroying the democracy. And mm-hmm. what is important in the contemporary climate is to note that most of the auxiliary precautions that Madison identifies in the Federalist Papers are gone. We have parties. He was saying there wasn't going to be parties. We have a large nation where instant communication and coalition building is easy, right? And so the opportunity or the ways that this large republic was going to make it harder for these factions to go together, to come together and rend society apart are, are no longer there and his arguments no longer hold. And so I think that is a, a, something that, uh, you know, we just have to come to terms with in terms of his argument. I think Madison was actually quite explicit in saying that the larger in the nation, the better he expected his system to work. Right. Um, and in fact, it was really part of the absolute genius of what he was doing. And it was a brilliant defense against the anti-federalists who always wanted things to be kept small. And Madison's argument was bigger is better because the bigger the country becomes, and keep in mind at this time, we're sitting on this huge unexplored continent, that the bigger the country would become, the more factions that would be entered in and the safer we would be because the multiplicity of factions would cancel one another out, balance one another out, and make it harder to create a majority faction that would be dangerous. So I think they would look at the large, gov- the large country and say, wow, we really got that part right, because they were quite explicit about saying that a large union would be better than a small union, and they were designing the system to allow for exactly that. Uh, the first part of what you were saying, though, I've, uh, going back a little bit before Chris about you know, we become more democratized over time, I think is a really important point and something that I, I think increasingly comes up and, and rubs up against the uh, Constitution. The story of the country is one of, until really recent years, of always increasing the franchise, bringing new groups into the democracy, of increasing participation, and increasing the size of the government in part because there is greater participation in it and people have more buy-in to it. But that does set up expectations about democracy that are not necessarily met by the system. 
something we clearly saw in two recent presidential elections where, you know, the majority of people think of the presidential election as a national vote, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And but they think of it that way because they're used to thinking of ever more democracy in the country. The other manifestation of factions is parties. And we have a two party system that I'm not sure if they anticipated or if you see that anticipation in some of the papers. But, you know, that to me is the real risk that they were worried about and that we're seeing play out in real time now. And what I'm particularly worried about, and I wonder if you see this sort of concern in any of their writing is what happens if there are, you know, sort of two majority factions and one faction does not see a path to victory. That's what I'm really concerned about right now. That was the argument I was making that, that they're, um, they're, strategy for avoiding this kind of splitting of the society into two groups, most of those strategies no, are no longer operative. Mm-hmm. And so you're left with the very thing that they were most fr- afraid of. I wonder about this. I often hear the argument that in talking about factions, they were really talking about parties. So they were concerned about parties. And I don't know why they didn't just say that if that's how they felt, because political parties were gonna form almost immediately, <laughs> right? It didn't take more than 10 years or something for, or maybe less, Chris. Oh, for, less. Yeah, for two political parties to form and then start to organize the government. And there's really excellent scholarship out there about why the formation of parties is just about inevitable in a democracy. I, I've often thought that by factions, they really meant exactly what they were saying. And that is that they were talking about interests. Now, they weren't talking about interest groups because interest groups didn't exist. They didn't have organized interests in that kind of sense. But I think that they were anticipating them. And I think they were anticipating a kind of pluralist politics where in their model, the national interest is never known. All right. It's an unknown thing. What's really the best thing to do, although elites might have an idea, but it's really an unknown thing. And the way to get there is through the process. And the process is the constant fighting and balancing among a multiplicity of interests. They talk all the time about a multiplicity of interests, Mm -hmm. that the bigger the country, the more there would be. You want states because there'll be different interests in the states. They wanted each institution to be controlled by somewhat different interests. And I've never really been comfortable with the idea that they meant parties because they knew what parties were and they could have said that we're really afraid of parties, we don't want them. But they were, they were talking about, I think, something different. Political parties would quickly form because they needed them to organize the government, to recruit candidates, to help run campaigns, to help with decision-making within the institutions. I, maybe they, I don't know, maybe they anticipated that. I don't think Chris agrees with me on this. So. I don't. Wherever you land on the question of our parties super factions, or are they something else? They do play an enormous role in how we vote today. And we get questions about this all the time. And we want in this series to both answer some very practical nuts and bolts questions about voting, and also think deeply about why we're doing all the things we're doing and what we want to do next. And so As you think about primaries versus general elections, the most important thing to consider is whether in your state you have to formally be tied to a party to participate in its primary or not. And states have different rules about that. We're sitting in Kentucky where we are a closed primary state. That means that if I am registered as an independent, there is not a way for me to participate in primary elections. I don't get any say in deciding who each party ultimately nominates for office to run in the general election. So I must formally affiliate with the party, even if that party doesn't match my perspective very well, if I want to be involved in that process. And I just want to strongly encourage you, if you live in a closed primary state, to make that selection, even if it feels uncomfortable to you, because as we watch the parties drift apart, the primary is where that happens. 
The people who vote in primaries have an enormous say in what types of candidates the parties are putting up, and the shrinking of people participating in that process over time has landed us in a more polarized space. Yeah, and there are as many ways to declare your party affiliation, it feels sometimes as there are states. I mean, there are some states where you can roll up on Election Day and pick and change. And there are some states you have to do it weeks in advance. And so this is a theme you're going to hear over and over and over from us. You need to make friends with your state Secretary of State's website um, because that's where you're going to find the information that you can trust as far as how your primary works, when your primary is, what are the registration deadlines? You know, there are a lot of really great organizations and websites. And, you know, if you have a small singular question, you're probably going to be able to answer it. You know, if you live in Missouri, is Missouri a closed primary state? If you Google that, you're going to get the answer. But it's always a good option to start with that Secretary of State's website so that you are sure what kind of primary process and party registration process you have in your state. That website is also going to help you understand who is eligible to vote in your state, which I think is a good question for us to ask as citizens. So even mm-hmm. if you voted in every election you've you've been qualified to vote in since you were 18 years old and never had a problem, it's good to know who else in your state is allowed to vote. Unfortunately, Many states have laws that prevent people who have committed certain crimes from voting. Many states have laws that make it difficult or impossible to vote without an ID. And in some of those states, having an ID also means having an address. Think of all the people who don't have an address that qualifies for ID purposes, which bridges to voting. So we talked with another expert, Professor Josh Douglas from the University of Kentucky's College of Law, about how reform to laws that disenfranchise voters is happening. Yeah, so felony disenfranchisement rules vary widely across the states. So some states disenfranchise former felons for life. You commit a crime uh, and you lose your right to vote forever. On the other side of the spectrum, two states allow uh, prisoners to vote from prison using absentee ballots. This is Maine and Vermont. Uh, And then there's a whole slew of kind of in-between laws. What we're seeing is many states are reducing the impact of those more extreme rules. So my state of Kentucky, for example, uh, is on the extreme side of disenfranchising felons for life. Uh, And I tell the story, I open the book with the story of this individual named Wes Powell, who did lose his right to vote for life after he committed a dumb crime. He stole a car radio from an auto salvage yard. Uh, This was about 25 years ago. He was 18 years old. He was caught and convicted, uh, ended up going to jail for about 11 months after he violated his parole because he had to work late and his parole officer caught him coming back after his curfew. And when he got out of jail, he said, you know, this is not who I am. I need to clean up my life. And so uh, he did. He uh, tried to find a job but had a hard time because of his felony conviction. So he opened up his own computer repair shop. He met a woman and got married. He had uh, five kids. And uh, yet he said he still didn't feel like he was fully a part of his society. Well, fast forward 25 years later to when the Kentucky legislature was considering a bill to allow some low level felons to get an expungement of their records, to wipe it off the books. And this had been proposed in previous years and never gone anywhere. But Wes Powell decided to testify before the committee that was considering the bill. And he told his story. He spoke for about four minutes I kind of soft spoken and he said, you know, my name is Wes Powell. I made a dumb mistake 25 years ago. I think I've paid for that mistake 25 times over. What, what more do you want me to do? And that convinced a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, a Republican named Whitney Westerfield, to change his mind. Uh, Westerfield told me he was opposed to felony expungement initially. He said, you know, you've done a crime. Why should we give you any leniency? But then he heard Wes Powell's testimony and he realized that this is a real thing that affects people. And he actually, during the hearing, said he was texting his fellow Republicans and saying, we need to get this done, not only for Powell, but for the thousands of others who are affected by the lifelong disenfranchisement. And they did get it done. They passed a bill to allow lower level felons to get an expungement of their records. You know, it's not perfect. You still have to pay administrative fee and too few felonies count as what are 
are eligible for expungement. But thanks to Whitney Westerfield's listening and Wes Powell's telling his story, Kentucky's worse than the nation law got a little bit better because now more people are eligible to vote. I think this is such a good example of what we want you to do and what we want to encourage and empower you to do throughout this series. Look at yourself. Get the answers to your questions. If you have questions about your individual registration, if you have questions about your state's elections, then yes, we need to get those answers. We need to figure out the basics and logistics of our individual roles as citizens within the United States government. But that process cannot stop there. And once we figure out in this example, am I registered to vote? Where do I vote? How does the voting process work in my state? Then realize that citizenship is a community act and ask yourself that next question. What does this mean for people in my community? Not just, am I registers? How do I vote? But my neighbor who has committed a felony, what does that mean for them? My neighbor who struggles with poverty or homelessness, what does that mean for them? Citizenship is a community act, and we have to engage with our individual needs and questions, and then we have to keep going. We can't do this from behind a computer screen. It's going to have to be out in the world. Well, and as you think about that community around you and how we might exclude part of the community for one purpose, think of how that excludes that part of the community for other purposes. Mm -hmm. If I say, oh, you're welcome to live here and I expect you to and I expect you to work. I expect you to pay taxes. I expect you to mow your lawn and just all sorts of things that make all of us feel safer and that make our community a nicer place to live. But you can't have this piece. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make a lot of sense. If we truly want our communities to function as communities, then we need to be inclusive at every step of the process. And that includes and I think starts with allowing people some say in who their representatives are. Well, and let me tell you what, and I know Beth has had experience with this. When you become a person who is even just individually very engaged with this process, First of all, it just can't help but bubble up in other areas of your life. And then the people in your community start to realize that you're the person to ask. And so you're going to get questions that don't individually affect you about voting options, which we're going to talk about next. You're going to get questions from people. I never got my absentee ballot. Do you know what I should do? Or can I take my absentee ballot into the uh, polling place? Or who should I vote for? I get that question a lot. I get calls in a little panic. I'm here. Who should I vote for? Because, again, I think that's such a beautiful expression of what this is really about. It's about all of us living together as we put forth into our community. This is something I care about. Then you're going to see people, people who will surprise you, reach out and be like, oh, I care about this, too, but I don't feel like I know the answer. Can you help me? And hey, friends choosing to listen to a political podcast, don't be judgy when people ask you that. Don't say, Mm -hmm. why don't you do your research? (laughs) You know, be delighted that you can be that person for other folks in your community. This This brings to mind for me one of my favorite things that I saw when we went to the Iowa caucuses. We go in and, you know, we've had this extremely long Democratic primary by the time you get to the Iowa caucus and so many options. And deep and long. It was deep and long. Deep and long. That's right. <laughs> and so we go into this community gym where this caucus is taking place. And I immediately was drawn to the handful of people who were standing by a sign that said uncommitted. Because I just thought, wow, like you went to the trouble to come here and you've lived in Iowa. So you've probably personally met a lot of these candidates or at least had an opportunity to. And you still don't know. How can that be? And I started talking to one of the women who was standing by that uncommitted sign. And I watched her for the rest of the night. And I eventually saw her go over to the Amy Klobuchar section. And so I walked over and said, what made you decide? And it was that 
a cluster of her neighbors were there. And they came over to talk to her about why they were there. And she said, I trust them. We talk in the backyard when we're watering our flowers. And that's, I just thought, I want to be that neighbor that someone trusts to help make a decision like this. Because the answer is not every single American plugs into this process to the extent that I do. And it shouldn't be. We would lose our minds if every single American (laughs) plugged into news and politics at the level that I do. There is something really good and hopeful to me about that woman trusting her community. So let's be the people that are trusted in our communities to answer those questions. Well, and there's just a part of the process that you can't even answer the questions for yourself until you're out in it. Like I think about all the time when I lived in Washington, D.C., I worked for the United States Senate. I had a law degree. And a laptop. And I thought, okay, I want to move back to Paducah. And I don't feel like I'm, I really understand how our local city government works. And I could not figure it out. I could not make sense of it with my law degree, my experience in government, and the websites. I just couldn't. It just, I could, I could never quite make it click. Even though it's not super complicated. We have a city manager form of government. The city manager is like the CEO. The board of commissioners is like the board of directors. But it's like I just there was just something missing. Like I needed to be here. I needed to have people in my life that served on the commission. I needed to read news headlines about the decisions they were making for it to finally click. I needed to engage with it, not just research it. I mean, even think about what we said at the top of the show. You and I, who host a political podcast, who've been to the Iowa caucuses and conventions, who spend hours every week thinking about politics, thinking about our government. And we both had an aha moment. We were like, oh, yeah, shoot. They did put Congress in Article One. (laughs) Just think about that. Like, it's it's a living, breathing thing. It's not a book you're going to read and be done. It has to be a part of you and a part of your life. It's like I said, it's not a membership. It's a part of who you are. You are a citizen of the United States. What does that mean to you? What does that look like in your life? So let's talk again about the way we vote because this is so present for everybody, especially through a pandemic. Currently, if you go back to what is America? Okay, we were a collection of states that ultimately came together to form a national government while maintaining those state governments. Voting really clearly shows that tension between the two, because so often we are voting for national representatives through a process determined only by our states. Mm -hmm. That has advantages and disadvantages. There are important aspects of being able to experiment with ideas about voting, just meet the needs of your community, the geography of your area. And there are disadvantages and opportunities for real abuses in the process by having voting happen at a state level. And well, and listen, this is getting more complicated, I would argue, than it ever has been because of our current pandemic. You know, it's so easy to say, just go vote. Just go vote. (laughs) But between absentee ballots, voting by mail, voting early, voting early in person, voting on Election Day, it's become a complicated process. This delicate tension between processes set by states to pick national officials is it's getting bigger, bigger and wider. So we ask Professor Douglas about national standards around voting, and he shared some important thoughts with us. So we have such a decentralized system, and that's in part because the Constitution dictates that the times, places and manner of regulating elections shall be dictated by the states 
unless Congress intervenes. I think for some things, there should be a minimum floor. I think the U.S. Supreme Court should better protect the right to vote under the Constitution. And so there are standards by which you can't go under. You do think that there's some merit to localized control for experimentation. You know, you think about the 2000 presidential election and in Miami-Dade County, the use of the butterfly ballot, which was horrible and for many ways, mostly because it was just confusing to many voters as to how to vote properly using this ballot design. Imagine if that had been the ballot nationwide. I think that would be even more chaotic uh, if you had one ballot that just doesn't make sense. The other thing is that with local control, you can experiment with things a little more easily. So I love the idea of vote centers, for example, which is instead of having a home-based precinct where you have to vote at a particular spot that's closest to your address, you can vote at any vote center in the county. And they're all electronically connected so that when you check into one, you can't go to any of the others. Uh, but this just increases the convenience factor of voting because if you're out at, you know, near school or near work or out doing errands and you're near a vote center, then you can vote in that location. That was started by a guy named Scott Doyle in Larimer County, Colorado, a Republican county clerk. I don't think you'd get the momentum to try something like vote centers. It's such a very different method of voting if you had that at a national mandate, a, tap, a top-down requirement. Um, and so I think there's some good use of local experimentation to be able to try something new. And, you know, they found in Colorado that vote centers were extremely popular. They saved money. Uh, they improved turnout. They uh, were perfectly secure. And then it started to spread to other counties in Colorado. And now a bunch of other places use the vote center model as well. So I think it, there is some need for a national standard of minimum requirements and minimum ease of voting. But I also am skeptical that a top-down solution makes sense for every aspect of the voting process because I think that could lead to both poor results if you have a bad idea being mandated as well as um, a lack of experimentation for good ideas. So you mentioned at the beginning that lots of people are concerned with voter suppression. There's been so many news stories um, over the last few weeks where there were huge purges off the voter rolls and people looked into it and they were invalid and there were court challenges. Are there any forms or movements or campaigns that you think are really getting at some of the voter suppression problems across the country? Well, I think you know that's on two fronts where we, where we have to attack the voter suppression issues. So one uh, are these lawsuits, uh, which are, I think, needed and vital and uh, need to continue. And these have been things that have been happening for you know years where you have groups that are scrutinizing the processes of election administration and bringing suit when uh, you see things like voter suppression tactics, voter purges and whatnot. And so that neat work needs to continue. But on the other side, uh, or the, the second kind of front needs to be this positive, proactive movement toward making the rules easier, making them such that we don't have the kind of a possibility for but voter suppression. You know, when we just focus on the lawsuits and fighting back against the latest tactic, I feel like we're playing whack-a-mole. You, know, you just beat back one and another one pops up in its place. And so that's why I focus so much on doing an additional step of being proactive. So, you know, on the voter registration aspect, we can talk about automatic voter registration, uh, where the state has the responsibility of putting everyone on the voter rolls and only taking people off if they opt out, essentially. And so using the information that the state already has through TMV offices, you put everyone on the rolls and you send a postcard saying you're now registered to vote. And if you for some reason don't want to be on that list, you can opt out. And this helps to actually change the voter rolls dynamically because every time someone interacts with the DMV, they're automatically changing their information on the voter rolls as well without having to take any affirmative steps. And this started in, in Oregon and it spread to about a dozen states now. And it's loved by people on both sides because it cleans up the voter rolls dynamically and saves money. And so these sorts of processes reduce the opportunity for the voter purges that we're seeing in, in Kentucky and in Wisconsin are the two uh, most recent examples that I've read about. So I think both the lawsuits uh, from groups like the Lawyers Committee and the ACLU, as well as these proactive measures on better policies for election administration, uh, offer a, a good two-pronged approach. 
I loved his point because, again, Sarah pressing the gas in the national government. It is tempting to just be like, just pick a way. Just do one way. <laughs> but that tension between a collection of states under a federal government is we have lots of different needs and lots of different populations. And we have to be honest with ourselves about that. And that in the United States of America, whether it was 1787 or 2020, there's usually not one right answer. So let's bring it down now to the individual level. We've talked about the national level, the state level, the sort of community aspect. Let's just talk about you for a second, especially if you've never voted before. And if you've never voted before, I'm so excited for you that you're about to vote for the first time. It's such an important component of being a citizen, and I'm really excited that you're here. So individual ballots state by state are going to work differently. And here's my best advice. Like a recipe, read the whole thing first. Word. Understand everything that's on it. Read all of the directions, even if it looks completely obvious. Because in some states, the ballot is going to begin with a ticket option. It's going to mm-hmm. ask you, do you want to vote for the Republican or Democratic ticket? And in some states, if you fill in that bubble to say Republican or Democrat, the rest of your ballot is not going to mean anything. Because that's going to automatically check for you the Republican or Democratic candidate all the way down. Beth, I know that we don't do a lot of um, hardcore prescribing in pantsuit politics world. We do a lot of grace-filled nuance, influencing and empowering. But I feel comfortable in this particular situation that both of us would say, just don't ever vote straight party ticket. Do you feel comfortable with that? I feel comfortable with that. It might mean you often will end up choosing Mm -hmm. the Democrat or the Republican in every single race. To me, there is something meaningful about staring at that name and choosing to fill in the bubble beside it. Yeah, I'm definitely not saying don't ever fill a ballot, whether it's all Democrats. I ain't got no beef with that. I just think, why go all the way in there? (laughs) Why why get the ballot to engage with it in just a knee-jerk partisan way by filling in the party line. Well, the other aspect, too, is that you hopefully will have some nonpartisan races Mm -hmm. on your ballot. So you want to just read through the whole thing and understand everything that you're voting for. It is way too hard in most parts of this country to, in advance, get a copy of your ballot that is complete and accurate for your precinct. You know, there it is way, way, way too hard to know beforehand what all is going to be on the ballot. So when you get the ballot, read all the way through it. Read the directions. If you have any challenge to understanding those directions, if you have any challenge to reading, to actually using a pencil, like whatever obstacle there is between you and successfully completing that ballot so it counts, you are entitled to ask someone for help. The people who work these elections are there to ensure that your vote will count. So please do not hesitate. Please do not feel dumb. Ask them Mm -hmm. to make sure that you understand and that you get the assistance that you need to get that ballot completed in a way that it will count. And there are lots of websites. I kind of went and engaged with a couple of them, vote.org, Ballotpedia, you know, I think part of it is it takes them a while and it's much closer to the election till you can actually see the ballot. I don't think any of them are bad. And I think many of them are helpful. I just think that you have to view those websites if you really, really want to see the ballot beforehand or if you want to get some background information on who's on your ballot. Like they're good. They're just they're always view them as a first step. They're just the first step. If that's what you want, if you want to find as much information as you can before you go in there, I think it's just always important to think about them as a first step. And we're going to talk about about our individual processes when we're really trying to find out more information about candidates later in the series. But just for the the ballot access, there are good websites out there and a lot of Secretary of State's websites will show you your ballot. It's just don't get discouraged if you can't find it and definitely read it if you haven't seen it when you walk in there that day, or if you have, truly. And this is another area where we have more influence as citizens than we feel. If you can't find it, call your county clerk 
Mm -hmm. and just say, I can't find this anywhere. Can you either walk me through it or tell me where I can find it? And if county clerks aren't putting it out on their websites and they get enough calls like that, they'll start doing it, you know? So raise your hand because you are entitled to that information. And listen, the county clerk is not the only person you can call. Phone a friend. Citizenship is a community act. Not only may you become the person that people reach out to for information, I promise you, you have a person in your life already that you can reach out to and say, I, this doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand this issue. I think I'm missing something. Who's on our ballot? Do you know this person? Listen, y'all reach out to us. We are your phone of friends, too. And that's f- perfectly fine. Like that is what we're here to do with each other is if you don't feel like you get it, just don't stop. Just don't stop and say, well, I can't be the citizen I want to be because on my own as an individual, I can't get this question answered because citizenship is a community act. So go out and find somebody who can help you answer your questions about your ballot or about officials or about our government, because this is what we're talking about. Right. When we say what is the United States of America? It is the consent of the governed. It is the power of the people. It is this exchange of duties and responsibilities, of questions, of answers, of problems, of solutions between the citizen and its government. So on Friday, we are going to talk more about voting and about all of the factors on our minds as we go in to make those choices, how we do it, and what other questions we can all ask ourselves about citizenship in connection with the voting process. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to continuing this conversation on Friday. Until then, keep it nuanced, y'all. Pantsy Politics is produced by Studio D Podcast Production. Elise Knapp is our managing director. Dante Lima is the composer and performer of our theme music. Our show is listener-supported. Special thanks to our executive producers, Tim Miller, Tiffany Hasler, Joshua Allen, David McWilliams, Allie Edwards, Martha Brunitsky, Amy Whited, Janice Elliott, Sarah Ralph, Barry Kaufman, Jeremy Sequoia, Lori Lodow, Emily Neasley, Allison Luzader, Tracy Putoff, Jared Minson. To support Pantsuit Politics and receive lots of bonus features, visit patreon.com slash pantsuitpolitics. You can connect with us on our website, pantsuitpoliticsshow.com.